A nearby resident smelled something sickening at the bridge party one afternoon. Little did anyone know it was coming from a nearby cabin that would soon make headlines as one of the most disturbing crimes in the state's history. Welcome to my channel, Ghostly Crimes. As you can tell by the name, I'm a crime channel and sometimes I tell spooky stories as well. If this interests you, then hit the subscribe button. Today's case is about the Robison family. It was over 50 years ago that a quiet, almost idyllic northern Michigan town became one of the most disturbing crime scenes. The Robisons were upstanding people, a tight-knit family of six, leaving their busy life in Lethrop Village, Michigan to spend the summer in their cottage at a secluded resort area in Goodhart, Michigan. The family had purchased the cabin a decade earlier. They loved the isolation that Goodhart provided, which stretches through forest. A visitor may miss this town completely as it was nearly impossible to see from the road. The area was secluded and tall pines and dense woods surrounded it. Here, tucked below the scenic shoreline road, there were lodges with lake frontage as the Robison cabin. The year was 1968. Only a few months prior, Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. And only a couple weeks before their trip, Robert F. Kennedy was assassinated as well. But the Robisons had one thing on their mind. With the exception of a trip to Kentucky to buy a horse ranch and Florida to buy a condo, the summer was so special. This was the first time the Robisons planned on spending their entire summer at the cabin. They had nicknamed Somerset. As you can tell, they were quite wealthy. Most people couldn't afford a condo, let alone a whole horse ranch. But that's exactly what Richard was going to do for his daughter, the apple of his eye, little Susie, who loved ponies. The family packed their bags and on June 16, the Robisons left their family home for a log and stone cottage. At 42 years old, Richard Robison had done well for himself. He was an advertising executive who had owned a magazine called Impasario. His wife, 40-year-old Shirley, was a housewife looking after the home and family. Their children had enjoyed a stable and loving upbringing. Richie, the eldest son, attended Eastern Michigan University. The younger children did well in their studies, and family friends said that they were smart and polite children. So why would the family be slaughtered in a violent manner? Richard Robison was relaxing in an easy chair with his youngest son, Randy, standing beside him. Shirley sat in an armchair nearby. The oldest boys, Richie and Gary, were playing double solitaire at the table, while little Susan played on the living room floor. Unbeknownst to the Robisons, a killer was approaching from the woods. The assailant came out of the woods, approached the window, and fired several shots from a .22 caliber rifle into the living room shooting Richard in the chest. Then they burst through the door before anyone could grasp what had happened, shooting Randy and Shirley and then shooting little Susie as she ran for cover. Their older boys, Richie and Gary, ran for the back bedroom where a rifle was kept in the closet, but the killer got to the boys first. The killer then bludgeoned Susie with a hammer and shot each family member in the head with a .25 caliber handgun. Then they locked the doors, closed the shades, and put cardboard over the bullet holes in the walls. The assailant also left the heater on. Mind you, it was a hot and humid summer. A note found on the front door of the Robison cabin said the family would not return until July 10. As I mentioned earlier, the Robisons had told people they were going to Arizona and then Florida and would be back in July, so their absence didn't alarm anyone. By now, several weeks had gone by and no one had seen them. For the next 27 days, the bodies lay in a heated cabin as dust settled on the family's two parked cars. A sickening smell wafted over Blisswood. Nearby at Gladys Moore's cabin, women gathered for a bridge party. The foul smell at first was thought to be a dead raccoon in the crawl space. Gladys wasn't pleased with the smell and complained to Moni Shansi Bliss, but this time, all five of her friends had left because they couldn't handle the rotten smell. Moni, who served as a caretaker of the homes he once built as a carpenter, would just have to take another look. Moni knocked on the Robinson cabin door, but no one answered. It wasn't an easy task, but using his tools, he entered the house and immediately he saw a woman's body sprawled in the entryway. Behind her, several other bodies lying on the floor in pools of congealed blood. Armies of dead flies cover the wooden plank floors. Monty hurried to call the police. Monty said his father noticed bullet holes in the window of the cottage in July. 
and he had checked under the house after he smelled a strong odor, but Monty says he disregarded his father's suggestions as he did not investigate any further because he said he thought the bullet holes were caused by local troublemakers playing with pellet guns. When police entered the cottage 27 days later, they found Shirley Robinson's body under a blanket near the door. She was nude from the waist down and positioned in a sexual manner. But police believe that this was so when the crime scene was discovered, it would lead the police to think that the crime was part of a sexual attack. Now usually, when killers put a blanket over their victims, it is to show remorse. In this case, I'm not sure how much I believe that, as he bludgeoned a defenseless six-year-old with a hammer. A weapon that would surely have caused more pain than the one he used to kill his other victims. However, he could have possibly ran out of bullets at this point, but that still doesn't tell me he ever felt a sense of guilt. Wearing gas masks because of the stench, investigators searched for clues. Some money and jewelry were missing, Shirley's $9,000 diamond ring and a string of pearls, Richard's Omega watch and $700 he had withdrawn from a local bank that morning. Other expensive items including cameras, electronic equipment, and the children's wallets were left behind. Maybe the killer couldn't carry much with him, as no unusual cars were seen in Goodhart that day and no one asked about the Robinsons either, so maybe the assailant fled on foot. If there were fingerprints on the bloody hammer, they were wiped clean when a sheriff's deputy held the hammer for a news photographer. In an additional odd twist to this case, the sheriff, Sheriff Richard Zink, was on his first vacation in eight years. So the undersheriff, only a month into the job, was in charge of the biggest mass murder in northern Michigan. Quote, the undersheriff walked into the crime scene, picked up a hammer, and wiped it clean. It turned out the hammer was one of the murder weapons. Troopers Lewinsky and Hancock tried to secure the scene, but there was no crime tape at this time. Eerily, from inside the cabin, the phone periodically rang. They wondered if it were family or maybe the killer. I do wonder why no one answered the phone. Maybe not to contaminate the little evidence they had. It was then great plumes of smoke came out of the windows. The men hurried to investigate as they believed the cabin was on fire, but what they saw was far worse. Repulsive, actually. Hancock said the smoke was caused by the furnace, a floor hung type that was under some of the bodies in the hallway. Particles of flesh and such were falling on the furnace and causing it to smoke. The bodies were in such wretched conditions that the hospital in Petowski refused to accept them. Instead, autopsies were performed inside a chicken coop at the local fairgrounds. The following are reports and descriptions of where the bodies were found and autopsies that were done throughout the years. Shirley was found lying on her stomach on the floor in the southeast section of the living room. A plaid blanket was covering her body except for the area below her knees. A .25 caliber slug was found in her first autopsy. Her watch had stopped at 6.40, possibly due to impact when she had fallen. Years later, they tried to test the pubic hair that was found on Shirley's body. However, it was shown to be consistent with Shirley's own. Richard was found lying on the floor in the hallway over the hot air register. He was shot once in the head. A .25 caliber slug was found in the first autopsy. He also has skull fractures and evidence of blunt force trauma. During the second autopsy, a .22 caliber slug was found. Investigators believe he initially was shot in the chest with a .22 caliber rifle, then in the head with a .25 caliber pistol. His watch had stopped at 9.59. Richie was found in the northwest bedroom of the structure, partially in the hallway and partially in the bedroom. His legs were extended out into the hallway. The couple's oldest son had multiple gunshot wounds to the head linked to a .25 caliber slug. Gary was found lying on his back along the east wall of the northwest bedroom. The teen had two gunshot wounds to the head and both linked to a .25 caliber slug. The second autopsy found a .22 caliber slug and evidence that he was also shot in the back. Randall was found lying on top of his father. A lavender colored rug was on his shoulders down to his buttocks. The youngest son's cause of death is listed as a gunshot wound to the head. No bullets were recovered during the autopsy. Susan was found lying on her back in the hallway at the south side of her father. The couple's youngest child was shot in the face. A .25 caliber slug was recovered from her clothing. She had a skull fracture, most likely from the claw hammer found at the scene. 
bloody footprints on the floor led investigators to conclude that one person had committed the murders. There was no sign of forced entry, perhaps they knew the killer, and even invited them in hoping they would help Richard after he was shot through the window. Then again, would the door be locked if it had been early in the day? Shirley's mother, Mrs. Aline Fulton, told police that such a trip would be out of character for the family and that she herself was planning to spend some time with her daughter and son-in-law. Authorities eventually placed the date and time of death in the late afternoon or early evening of Tuesday, June 25, 1968. This was the day after Monty's son had died from a motorcycle accident. The family was last seen at 4.30 by the tree trimmers who clocked out of work and were paid by Richard himself a $170 check. The trimmer later arrived around 5 to finish the work but he said he saw no one at the cottage. No one thought it was odd that the cars were still parked as Richard flew his own plane and they could have been picked up as well. The neighbors who were 100 yards away weren't home but another couple living a quarter mile away heard loud voices of two men and a woman and gunshots but assumed they were shooting seagulls on the beach since the witnesses heard shots around 8 or 9 p.m. that day and it was summer so it would have still been light outside. An unknown user online said, quote, the same day or within a day or two when the Robinson family was thought to have been murdered, it was evening and my parents were on the beach, very close to the Robinson cabin. As my father told the story, he and my mother were relaxing on the beach and my father was shooting at seagulls with a .38 revolver. It grew darker and at some point my father and mother saw a lantern in the woods. My father, believing it was Richard Robinson, called out in the direction of the lantern, Is that you, Richard? And then the lantern went out. I asked my father if he ever reported any of this to the investigators and he said yes. Goodhart wasn't used to murder. No one knew who would want to hurt an innocent family. At first, the answer was nobody except perhaps some madman or drifter who had stumbled upon the isolated cabin. Investigators looked deeper into Richard Robison. On the outside, Richard seemed like an average guy. Friends described him as honorable, eccentric, and a family man. Richard and his wife didn't drink or smoke, but as for Richard, he was far from perfect. A little digging revealed that he'd had several affairs. He also had the habit of inviting a secretary into his office and asking her to lift her skirt up to her waist while he admired her legs. No sex was involved, but sometimes the oogling and fondling lasted as long as an hour. Richard was described as a schizophrenic and a tirade, but then again a genius with a magnetic personality. The conflicting appraisals were at times volunteered by the same person. Investigators soon learned that Robison's advertising business had been losing money for some time. Perhaps as a result, the agency had swindled its largest client, Delta Fawcett, out of as much as $50,000 over a three-year period. Police also discovered that Richard's art magazine, Impresario, had inflated its circulation numbers and was using full-page airline ads without authorization to make the magazine appear more successful. The choice of ads was telling as Richard saw Empresaria as being a marketing tool for a giant, international computerized warehouse. Each would be based at the airport and future a flying cultural center. And detectives were even more puzzled by letters and drawings found among Robison's business papers. Notes referred to a $100 million computerized warehouse scheme with investors known only as the Superior Table. The head of the table was a mysterious figure named Robert, and a list of other names. Who were these people? Friends? And business partners? No one seemed to know. A cryptic reference to Robert included a St. Christopher medal Richard wore that was engraved with the words, Richard, to my chosen son and hire, God bless you, Robert. This was found around Richard's neck after an autopsy. Everyone, including the family, were shocked by this religious medal. Was Mr. Robert or Robert expected on the night of the murders? If so, no such person arrived at the airport or inquired about the family afterward. However, Richard's father, Ross Robison, said they were waiting for Mr. Roberts to take them on their private jet down south. He was supposedly staying with them at the cottage for a few days. The odd thing is, Shirley had told her best friend Margaret Smith what Richard had told his father. Who was Mr. Roberts and other members of the superior table? Were they real or part of some elaborate fantasy? To this day, nobody knows. Perhaps they met Mr. Roberts the night of the murders. Richard's business partner, Joseph Scalero, had no idea who Roberts was, 
but Richards had been telling people of the big business ventures. Some of those people had even spoken to Roberts and claimed he wanted to set up an appointment to work on the specifics of the enterprise. The caller apparently was suspicious and spoke in a slow monotone voice with frequent pauses. They believed they were speaking to a robot. Was Mr. Roberts the murderer or one of the five investors? Or was he invented in a swindle by Richard or Joe or both? For now, Mr. Roberts was just a ghost who spoke eerily robotic and disappeared four days before the murders. Oddly, two of Joe's close-by neighbors told detectives they were asked to make strange calls to Richard, but their thick accents bothered Joe and after some rehearsing, one of the men passed and made the call. They were asked not to speak so much and if there were questions, tell Richard to speak to Joe. If there were any truth to this, it would make sense as to why Mr. Roberts sounded very robotic. Police Detective Lloyd Stern said, None of them could recall just what the content of the note was, but it went something like the following. I'm calling in regards to the deal we have been working on with Mr. Scolaro, and my client has informed me that he will go as much as five, but no more. If you want any more of the details, contact Mr. Scolaro as he has the complete package. Police confirmed the calls were made around June 24th from Joe's house. The same neighbor also mentioned that he had seen Joe's AR-7 with a .22 caliber and that he had even gone target shooting with Joe. Joe told investigators in spring 1968 he bought two .25 caliber semi-automatic Berettas, one for himself and one for Richard. Richard's was never found but Joe's was tested and not a match but similar to the ones fired in the cottage so Richards couldn't have been involved either. But a .22 rifle was still being investigated. Monty's, the tree trimmer, as well as other neighbors and folks of Goodhart's rifles were tested. Nothing came up as a match. Officers also discovered that shell casings found at the shooting range Joe frequented matched casings that police found at the scene of the crime. Joe Scalaro had owned two model AR-7 .22 caliber rifles. One was recovered from a friend in Chicago, but the other, supposedly given to his brother-in-law, was never found and believed to be the murder weapon. On the morning of June 25th, Richard Robinson made several phone calls from the cabin. He called the National Bank of Detroit where his agency kept his checking account. Richard asked if his $200,000 deposit had arrived. It had not. The bank official inquired about the low balance. Richard then called his office where his business partner, Joseph Scalero, was running things in Robison's absence. Joe joined Richard's advertising and publishing business in 1965. Before this, he had spent three years in the army and a year at Harvard. He had quickly gained his boss's trust, but an audit performed after the murder showed that nearly $8,000 or $70,000 today had disappeared from the agency's account between June 25th and when the bodies were discovered July 22. The checks had been signed by Joe. A secretary at Robinson's ad agency recalled that Richard was irate when he demanded to speak to Joe. After this conversation ended about 10.30 a.m., investigators were told that Joe left the office immediately. Police believe that during a phone call between Richard and Joe hours before the murder, Richard revealed that he had found out about the embezzlement. At this point, according to police, a panicked Joe took off from Detroit, drove several hours north to Goodhart, and killed the family before Richard Robinson could come forward with the details about Joe's crime. There's a good chance that Joe knew how to get to this isolated cabin that was hard to find and had even visited a few times. But he wasn't a violent man and had no criminal history. Circumstantial evidence supported this conclusion. Joe had been out of contact with friends, business associates, and family members for 11 hours on the day of the murder, and police couldn't find anyone to support his alibis. In addition, Joe failed two polygraph tests and delivered inconclusive results on a third. To officers, Joe was a prime suspect. Joe told police when he left the office it was noon and then he went to the electronics store. 
then to a plumber's conference for Delta faucets because Richard wanted him to meet people. However, most people were packing up their displays by 1pm, so he wouldn't have met very many. Also, no one could confirm he was there on June 25th, but they remember him being there on the 24th, which was a sunny day. He told police that after the plumber's conference, he went and grabbed a drink at a hotel bar, and then he went by the Robison family home in Lethrop Village to check the basement for flooding as it had been raining heavily, and then he spent about an hour cleaning it up before returning home at 11 o'clock at night. His wife confirmed he was home by then and in the morning she had soaked clothes waiting in the laundry for her. The attendees that represented Delta Fawcett Company placed Joe at the convention on June 24th, not June 25th. Detectives also inspected the basement of the Robison home and found no water damage. But if Joe was home by 11, then there would be no possible way for him to have committed the murders. So the ride from Birmingham to Goodhart is about 4 hours, but at the time police estimated 5 to 6 hours and the neighbors claimed to hear the shots around 9pm. As again, it would have taken 5 to 6 hours back home. Joe wasn't flying and he didn't have a license to fly either. He had no speeding ticket for that night, and even if he had been speeding, surely someone would notice. But then again, a whole month had gone by and we can't say for sure if the neighbors were correct about their timing. A bloody shoe print was found at the crime scene and it was found to be a perfect match to Scalero's boots. Although Joe's boots were brand new, investigators found out that he was known to typically purchase two of the same items. This led them to believe that the other pair was the one used during the Robison murders. Unfortunately, they couldn't find the murder weapons nor an eyewitness to the crime. The prosecutors in Emmett County where the Robison's cabin was located didn't press charges. It was believed they didn't have the funds to either. Frustrated state police officers worked with prosecutors in Oakland County where the Robisons lived to continue the investigation, and in 1973, they were finally ready to charge Joe Scalera with conspiracy to commit murder. However, it was too late. On the afternoon of May 8, 1973, Joe sent his mother out on an errand. He taped a handwritten note on the outside of the door that read, Mother, don't you come in. I will already be dead. Please have someone else come in, and you call the police, or whatever, Joe. He sat down at his desk and put a piece of paper in his typewriter and drafted another short note. He took this note out of the typewriter, signed it, and added a postscript and laid it on top of his desk. He took his Beretta handgun out of his desk drawer, loaded it with 8 rounds of .25 caliber bullets, put it to his right temple, and pulled the trigger. The note on the desk read, Mother, where do I start? I am a liar, cheat, phony. Any check that any of the people have with your signature isn't any good because I forged your name to it to get them off my back. I owe everybody you can think of. I have made poor investments and in some cases no investments at all. I love you dearly but living only causes you more heartache. I know I'm sick but seeking help isn't going to help the people I've hurt. I just can't help myself. Please understand. Love Joe. P.S. I had nothing to do with the Robisons. I'm a cheat but not a murderer. I'm sick and scared. God and everyone, please forgive me. I hope my family will understand. When Joe died, he took the whole Robison murders with him. After his death, the case went cold. However, to investigators who worked on the case for years, there were no doubts in their minds that Joe was the killer. By Joe's own admission, he was a cheat and liar. In my opinion, he didn't want his mother to find out even after he was long gone. Personally, I feel Joe was involved. I believe on the day he left his office, he was heading over to murder the Robisons. He killed the whole family so none of the Richards' children could take over their father's business. Joe may have parked his car in a secluded area and walked through the forest. I feel that when the timing was right, whether it was daylight or twilight, he fired his first rounds. Joe was a highly skilled trap shooter and he knew how to target anything fast moving. I'm going to assume that Robert or Robert was created by Joe as a way to get Richard to respect him or even wire money through him believing it was going towards their new business venture. No one had seen that necklace around Richard's neck prior to the murders. I believe Joe placed it there after he had murdered Richard. He most likely engraved it himself so that it couldn't be traced to the store or back to him. He wanted investigators to believe that this Robert man, ghostly figure, 
is the one who murdered the family. There is no evidence that Richard ever met Robert, but that night of the murders, he had, and it was Joe. But this is just my opinion. That's not to say that Joe Scalaro is the only person who has been accused of killing Richard Robison and his family. Critics believe that Joe Scalaro couldn't have driven to Goodhart and shot the Robinson family, and then driven back to Detroit area in the amount of time for which he didn't have an alibi. Some people suspect that John Norman Collins, who was convicted in 1970 of killing a female college student, and Ypsilanti, who is a suspect in the killings of several other co-eds, a series of crimes that has become known as the Michigan Murders, was somehow involved in the Robison murders. Collins attended Eastern Michigan University at the same time as Richie Robison, and was even said to have possibly roomed with him during an orientation week. Their beliefs are he may have known the Robisons were wealthy and have even known where the cabin was located. Another proposed suspect is Blisswood's caretaker, Monty Chauncey Bliss, who found the bodies. Bliss was known to be a bit eccentric and some Goodhart locals believe he committed the murders after his son, who was friends with the Robinson boys, died in a motorcycle accident shortly before the Robinson murders. According to this theory, Bliss felt slighted by Richard Robinson in the days following the younger Bliss's death and took his revenge by killing the family. But Monty was investigated and they checked his guns and nothing matched. Monty may have been a little bit odd, but he was harmless. In 2003, evidence was brought out of storage and underwent DNA analysis. There were hopes that a match could be made with a known suspect or someone cataloged in the National Criminal Database. However, the evidence was too degraded to yield any conclusive results. Today, nothing remains of Somerset. The lingering stench caused the cottage to be leveled and burnt a year after the Robison murders. The wood was too impossible to clean and the body fluids and the smell lingered. Even a foot of sand beneath the foundation had to be replaced. Occasionally there'll be the strangers who come to visit the property, possibly drawn to the history or struck by the tranquility. But they are quickly chased off like the Robison's premature departure from Blisswood. What do you think happened to the Robison family? I would love to know. Thank you so much for dropping by, and if you haven't subscribed yet, please do so. Until next time, take care and stay safe.